Hello, welcome to our webinar on understanding evidence. I'm Laura Papard. I'm the Deputy Director for Treatment and Prevention at the Washington Baltimore High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area. I also serve as the Director of ADAPT, which stands for a Division for Advancing Prevention and Treatment. It's a new division that's housed at the Center for Drug Policy and Prevention at the University of Baltimore, but ADAPT serves as a training and technical assistance provider for the National HIDA program related to substance use prevention programming, supporting all those efforts across the United States. I wanted to just give us a little context today to set the stage for what we're about to experience and learn in this Understanding Evidence webinar. I think it's important for you all to understand where HIDA is coming from. Approximately two thirds of Americans live in HIDA communities. So we are trying to support advancing substance use prevention efforts in those communities in ways that make sense for HIDA prevention. But while HIDA prevention is not new, the strategy for HIDA prevention is fairly new. It's about two years old. And the mission of that strategy is to promote and support integration of evidence-based programming or evidence-informed programming into our nation's communities. And that's it. It's a simple mission, but it's a big deal and it's a big effort. And one of the ways that we hope to support that is by offering you this webinar today as a grounding element in understanding evidence and ways of thinking about it as you operate your own substance use prevention programming in your area. The HIDA mission and today's webinar align nicely with the drug policy priorities that have come out from the Biden administration, specifically number four. If you have an opportunity, just Google it, drug policy priorities for the White House. They came out back in April. And number four is supporting evidence-based prevention efforts to reduce youth substance use. And this is, again, one way that we'd like to align and support that particular drug policy priority as well is by offering this to you today. You should understand that HIDA prevention really falls underneath a larger umbrella for national HIDA that's called a public health, public safety framework. And our direct public health partner in this is the Centers for Disease Control. We are so fortunate today to have with us Sally Thigpen from the Division of Injury Prevention, as well as Natalie Wilkins from the Division of Adolescent and School Health. They are GEMS and they have very graciously volunteered their time today to be able to share with you the framework for thinking about evidence. And on the website that they'll refer you to today, it's called Understanding Evidence and conceptually, that is our goal, is to really break down the concept of understanding evidence into relatable and digestible pieces, relatable in language for you, relatable in experience for you, and digestible enough so that you can absorb it and immediately apply it upon conclusion of the webinar. I wanna thank Sally and Natalie for joining us today. And I wanna thank Patty Versazidis, who is the Assistant Director of ADAPT for supporting all of these technical webinars and coordinating today's. Patty, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Laura. And just before we get started, just have a couple of housekeeping items for our audience members today. What you see in front of you is just a screenshot of what your audience interface should look like on your own computer desktop. I want to draw your attention to two areas. The first is underneath the presenter image, you'll see a box that says, ask a question. This is where we really encourage you to ask questions, enter thoughts, make comments as we go along. We'll be having natural stopping points throughout the presentation to take those questions, as well as to um, share some of the responses and comments and thoughts that are coming through. Right below the Ask a Question pane is a section called Event Resources. If you click on the little arrow next to the word Event Resources, you will see a PDF of a document, a resource supplement, where you can go ahead and um, download that and it will have access to resources that are recommended by the presenters, including the slides from today, as well as some additional resources recommended by the ADAPT team. 
Just a quick note, at the end of the webinar, you will receive a post-presentation evaluation. It'll just automatically pop up for you on your screen. If you're able to take a couple of minutes to complete that, you will automatically receive an email with a link to download a certificate of completion for today's events. And this is a continuing education event for 1.5 CEs. If you have any technical issues during today's webinar, feel free to contact us one of two ways. The GoTo webcast technical support line, which is on your screen, or you can email us at our ADAPT email. So I'm now pleased to announce our, or introduce our two presenters. Dr. Natalie Wilkins is a behavioral scientist at the CDC's National Center for HIV AIDS, Hepatitis, STD, and TB Prevention in the Division of Adolescent and School Health. Her work focuses on promoting positive youth development through applied research, knowledge translation, and understanding the links between multiple forms of violence, injury, and other public health outcomes. She's received her BA in Psychology and Sociology from the University of Richmond and an MA and PhD in Community Psychology from Georgia State University. Sally Thickman joined CDC in 2009 in the Injury Center's Division of Violence Prevention after nearly 15 years leading efforts to prevent child abuse and neglect in a variety of roles, including as Associate Director for Programs at Prevent Child Abuse Georgia. Sally's currently a health scientist with the Division of Injury Prevention in the Injury Center. She provides support across the Injury Center for program evaluation and research with specific expertise and actionable knowledge to promote behavioral and social change. Sally received her Bachelor of Arts in Sociology and Anthropology from Agnes Scott College and a Master of Public Administration that incorporated behavioral theory and research from the Andrew Young School of Public Policy at Georgia State University. Welcome presenters, and we'll first hand it over to Dr. Natalie Wilkins. Thank you, Patty. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be here with you all today. Um, as Patty mentioned, my name is Natalie Wilkins, and I'm a behavioral scientist in the Division of Adolescent and School Health here at CDC. And Sally and I are both really excited to talk with you all today about um, one of the areas of research and practice that's been near and dear to our heart for a very long time, and that's our understanding evidence work and the understanding evidence website and framework um, associated with that. Really, the purpose of our time together today, we hope, is to learn from you all about the ways that you're thinking about evidence in the work that you're doing in substance use prevention, um, and to share some of the lessons learned um, that we have accumulated over the years as we've worked with subject matter experts in this area from across the world, as well as a lot of our partners in the field, um, in local health departments, state health departments, um, NGOs, We've really been very lucky to have a wide range of um, folks that have worked with us on this project and on this concept over the years and are excited to, to share with you some of the lessons learned from that work. So with that, we're gonna start off um, with a question that we'd like to pose to everyone. Um, and if you can type your answers in the chat box, it'll give us an idea of what evidence base really means to you. This is a term that we hear a lot in the field of public health, in substance use prevention. Um, but really, there are different ways that this term evidence-based can be interpreted, and there are different ways that people um, think about and use this in their work and apply this, this concept in their work. So if folks could type in the chat box what evidence-based means to you um, when you're thinking about your substance use prevention work, that'll help us get a sense of where folks are at. And I'm realizing now, um, Patty and Laura, I'm not sure if I can actually see the chat box. Oh, okay, I can see it now, okay, <laughs> great. Yeah, there is, there's a little time delay, so we'll just have to sit tight for a few moments while folks go ahead and put their comments into, the, into the, um, their chat box. We see some coming in now. Perfect, okay, I see documented positive outcomes from a particular program to attend real problems with real solutions, research-based, measurable outcomes, proven outcomes, facts that can be supported by data. Yes, this is great. These are all really consistent with the ways that um, we found folks in the field, um, in research settings, we're defining evidence-based as well. Um, 
one of the the questions that we had though when we first started on this work in this work is that when we think about how to integrate and make sure that the approaches the prevention approaches that we're putting in place and supporting are evidence based it's oftentimes a little bit more complicated than just looking to see what's been proven through research studies and through research evidence. Because when you take those strategies and you try to implement them in real world settings, sometimes there are a lot of barriers that can kind of come up um, as, you, as you are working to, to integrate those strategies across different contexts and within different communities. So, you know, one of the metaphors that um, we talked about a lot when we were working with our partners around some of the struggles they were having with implementing evidence-based strategies in real world settings was that, you know, oftentimes you could have a strategy that has been researched um, or, you know, put through a really rigorous evaluation, found to be really effective in a particular setting. But then when it's ad adopted or um, uh, put in place in a different setting or in a different community, it completely flops or it's just a really bad fit or they just don't see the kinds of outcomes, the same kind of outcomes um, that were found in the first original implementation of that strategy. And so, you know, one of the metaphors that came up was it's sort of like fishing in a desert, right? So if we think about fishing as an evidence-based method for obtaining food, it can work really well in certain settings. Um, but it can be completely useless and very ineffective in other settings, like in this example in a desert, right? And so one of the things that we worked with our partners around is thinking about what, what are the different forms of evidence that are really essential when we're applying this concept of evidence to make decisions about which programs, practices, and policies are likely to be effective in real world settings in local communities. So, you know, you can have the most evidence-based researched program in the world, but if it's a bad fit for a local community, it's not going to be effective because it's not going to be implemented well. It's not going to be accepted by the community. So effectiveness is really relative. That research evidence is one piece of it, an important piece of it, um, but there are other forms of evidence that are also really critical and important when we're talking about um, at the end of the day, showing the kinds of effects that we're all working towards in local communities. So I think we're going to start now with um, a quick polling question. Is that right, Patty? That is right. I am sending it out to the audience members now. Great. And the first question just reads, where do you go to find evidence-based interventions? So audience members should see that on their screen now. It will give you all a few moments to go ahead and select your answer and then hit the submit button. All right, so Natalie, we have some of the results coming in. Are you able to see those? I can, that's great. So where do you go to find evidence-based interventions? It looks like a lot of folks are um, choosing options B and C, so technical assistance or resource centers, for example, the folks here at ADAPT. Um, peer recommendations is another big one. It looks like um, other is also selected. If folks wouldn't mind typing in the chat box, um, if you selected other, what are some of the other places that you go to to find evidence-based interventions? That would be great. And then also, um, somebody had asked previously, the chat feature is the same as the ask a question feature. So in that ask a question box, that is where you can an answer your, um, or enter in your responses. I see someone's um, added literature reviews. Yep, that's another great source of evidence-based interventions. And one of the things worth mentioning, um, as folks are typing in the chat box, um, that first option, program registries, um, there will be a list of program registries available for folks in the, um, the resources that, that follow, that ADAPT is going to be sending you from this webinar. Um, so you'll have that um, at your disposal after the webinar. Okay, it looks like um, published studies and articles. The New York State OASAS has a required list of programs that they allow us to use. Okay, so some state state guidelines. 
NREP. Yes, we were just talking about NREP and how we miss it. <laughs> Services offered by providing organizations, right? So sometimes we're limited by the services that are available in our communities, right, already. Partner agencies who perform pre and post tests, so have sort of generated their own local evidence and homegrown evaluations. That's great. Okay, these are all fantastic sources um, of finding evidence-based programs, right? And when we talk about best available research evidence, this is really what we're talking about. We're talking about um, what folks typically consider to be traditional forms of evidence. So studies, evaluations that have been done on programs um, to demonstrate whether or not they have had the intended effects um, that, they, that they were designed to have. So a few of the questions that this form of evidence can help us answer as we're thinking about potential prevention strategies we might wanna implement in the communities that we're serving um, are how many scientific, how much scientific research has been done on a particular program or strategy? What effects has the program had on your desired outcomes? How rigorously the program has been studied? And therefore, how much confidence can you really have in the validity of the study findings? And then finally, what implementation guidance is available and what does that guidance tell you about capacity needed to successfully implement the program? Um, so that's another important piece of best available research evidence is understanding not only the effectiveness of the strategy, but what kinds of supports come along with that strategy, because that's really important when, when deciding which prevention um, programs would be a, a good fit for your local communities. So one of the um, resources that we developed here at CDC to try and unpack this idea of the best available research evidence a bit more is the continuum of evidence of effectiveness. So when we talk about strategies that are quote unquote evidence-based, right? Typically what registries or um, you know, state guidance offices or um, clearing houses that, that rate programs and, and make the determinations on whether or not they're evidence-based, Typically, they're using these kinds of criteria um, to judge the, the strength of evidence, the strength of, of research evidence supporting a particular program or strategy. And I know the writing here is, is quite small, um, but we'll send follow-up materials where you can sort of explore and take a look at this um, uh, on your own. But you can see at the top there, there are a number of different domains horizontally going across this continuum. And at the top is effect. So the first thing that folks are looking for when they're um, determining the, the research evidence behind a particular program or strategy is whether or not it had the effects that it intended to have, right? Um, and then the second um, and third domains there, internal validity and research design, really get at how um, rigorous the program or, or approach was, was um, researched. So what does that research design look like? And therefore, how confident can we be that the effects that we saw in this study are due to the program and not something else? So you can see that really the um, strongest research design and strongest internal validity comes from a true experimental design or a randomized control trial. Um, but then there are other designs because we know in the real world, oftentimes randomized control trials are not possible or acceptable in community-based settings. So there are other designs like quasi-experimental designs, more observational types of studies um, that may be used as well. Um, they're not quite as rigorous, so we can't have quite as much confidence that the results that we're seeing were due to the program and not something else, but they can still be really helpful in giving us some some indication um, of, of the level of confidence we can have in those results. Independent replication um, is another sort of domain or aspect of best available research evidence. This tells us whether or not the program or strategy has been replicated in another setting and evaluated in another setting and whether or not they found the same results, which again can increase our confidence that the program is um, having the desired effect and it's not something else or some other fluke that's happening in the community to drive those effects. And then, um, as I mentioned before, implementation guidance. Does the program or strategy come with guidance so that other communities can pick up that program or strategy and implement it in their local community? Um, does it have coaching available from the, the um, program developers, uh, other materials, evaluation related materials and data collection um, instruments, those kinds of things. Are those available for folks that are looking to adopt that strategy or 
are you just sort of on your own? Because that's that's an important thing to consider when you're um, thinking about adopting a particular strategy. And then finally, external and ecological validity. This gets at the extent to which the strategy is likely to um, be able to fit and be a good fit in other communities other than the one that it was designed for originally. So have there been um, replications and applications of this particular program or strategy in different contexts with different populations? And if so, have we found the same effects? Um, are the effects really robust across different populations and contexts? Or is it something that maybe is like fishing in the desert, right? It's really great for certain contexts, but not for others. So these are really the domains that often um, folks are looking at when they're deciding whether or not um, programs or strategies really rise to the level of being evidence-based. Um, there's different definitions across different, all different registries, toolkits, guidance, resources, but overall, these are the, the sort of foundational domains that folks are typically looking at when they're determining the research effectiveness um, and evidence. And so it's also worth noting here um, that when you're looking at any particular prevention strategy or program, oftentimes you'll see that they sort of, the, the level of effectiveness or the strength of the evidence across these different domains often varies. Um, so you won't necessarily see that a program or strategy is in that well-supported, supported range for all of these domains, but maybe a few of them. So for example, um, maybe there was a study that was done on a prevention strategy that you're considering and they found great effects in um, the areas that they were hoping to. They used a quasi-experimental design, so not the most rigorous, but we can have a fair amount of confidence in the results, but they didn't replicate the study. It hasn't been implemented or evaluated in any other settings. Um, they only offer partial implementation guidance, which would mean that um, if you're the technical assistance provider or the folks that are really supporting people at the local level to implement the strategy, you may have to fill in a lot of the gaps and work with, with folks in the community to fill in those gaps. Um, and in terms of external and ecological validity, if it's never really been tested in any other settings other than the original one, it may be pretty low on external and ecological validity. So it may be unclear whether it's a, a good fit for your community or not. And so this is when um, we start thinking about, okay, this, this can be helpful, right? This provides us with a lot of helpful information in terms of the research evidence. Um, behind a strategy, but there are potentially a lot of gaps and a lot of questions that this leaves us with, right, in terms of whether a strategy would be a good fit for our local community or the local communities that we're serving and supporting. So that's when we get into some of the other forms of evidence um, that are a part of the framework for thinking about evidence. And I think now we're going to transition into our second polling question. All right, folks, the next question is coming out right now. This question asks, which of the following contextual factors can affect implementation of prevention strategies? So once again, select all that apply and go ahead and hit the submit button. All right, I see some results coming in. So it looks like folks have selected, for the majority, folks have selected all of these as potential contextual factors that would affect implementation. Um, you may see that that some of these are at various different levels, right? More at the, the societal or sort of policy level, things at the very individual level, demographics like age and gender, um, community history, factors that are more at the, the community level. Physical infrastructure, again, it's sort of the more community level. Um, I'm curious now, this is where I'd really love to know, for folks that are selecting other, what are some of the other aspects of local context in your experience that really influence or have an impact on the implementation of evidence-based strategies or prevention strategies in general, regardless of, of the research evidence behind them? Access to support and resources, absolutely, 
resources is the huge one, right? And resources could be things like money, right? The most basic resource, um, staff time, space even, right? If you need space for a prevention program, class period times and fidelity. Yeah, so class period times for school-based programs, right? It can be really difficult if you've got, say, a curriculum that you're considering and each session is 60 minutes, but class periods are only 45 minutes, it's really difficult to maintain fidelity to that evidence-based program, right? If, if that's the constraint that you're working within. Another funding, another funding, yep. Funding is a big one, um, maybe potentially one of the biggest, um, not only because some of these programs cost money, um, are proprietary and cost money like curriculum-based programs, but also just the implementation, staff time, all of those pieces oftentimes um, take a lot of resources to implement. That's great. Thank you for sharing those. So contextual evidence is the next form of evidence um, that's part of our framework when we're thinking about the kinds of information, the kinds of evidence that are really important when we're making decisions about what to implement. Contextual evidence um, are measurable factors in the community that are likely to influence the implementation of a strategy. And what contextual evidence does is it really provides us with information on whether or not a strategy is likely to be feasible to implement, right, in the community that we're, we're working with and serving, um, whether or not the strategy is likely to be useful within that context, um, and whether or not the strategy is likely to be acceptable to the local community as well, right? That's where factors like community history come into play. There are a number of questions that contextual evidence can help answer for us. Um, the first is, does the community have the resources, right? Um, and or capacity to implement the prevention strategy effectively? So do we have the staff time? Do we have the physical space and infrastructure? Do we have the funding to be able to support this? Um, it also tells us what the characteristics might be of the setting and the population to be served by the prevention strategy so that then we can kind of take a look and see from the evidence-based strategies that we're considering or the prevention strategies that we're considering, whether any of those strategies have been implemented in the past with, within similar settings or with similar populations or not. It also tells us about who will be implementing the strategy, which again gets back at that um, idea of capacity and acceptability. And then it also tells us how a setting um, or population's characteristics might affect the implementation of that prevention strategy, which again is sort of the, the, the core fundamental um, um, utility and contextual evidence as we're thinking about evidence-based decision-making. Here are some examples. Some of these will look familiar um, from that polling question. Um, that we just went through, but really sort of the, the key takeaway from this, um, from this slide is that contextual factors really exist across the social ecology. If folks are familiar with this concept of the social ecological model, you can think about factors that influence program implementation um, at the individual level. So things like an individual's income, age, gender, cultural identity, um, at the relationship level, so family health history, social capital, peer support, um, and then at the community level, things like community values, community history, the physical infrastructure of a community, and then all the way out to the societal level, um, things like laws and policies, the media, values and norms. These are all things that can really influence and impact um, the implementation of a particular prevention strategy and can either make a prevention strategy a great fit or potentially um, serve as barriers or make a prevention strategy not such a great fit for a local context. The one thing that's um, uh, important to, to note about contextual evidence is that there are lots of different factors in a community, right, that we would consider to be contextual factors, but things that are measurable and observable are the things that really sort of rise to the level of evidence. When we talked with lots of um, subject matter experts and folks in the field about where we sort of draw the line for contextual evidence versus just contextual factors, there were really two things that came up. The first was that contextual evidence has to be measurable, something that we can measure. And the second is that it has to be relevant, right? So for example, if you're looking at different prevention strategies that you might want to put in place um, with a local community around youth substance use, say school-based youth substance use prevention strategies, 
um, it may not necessarily be relevant that there are um, a high number of senior living facilities in that community, right? Unless that substance use prevention strategy has some sort of connection with um, elders in the community, that piece of contextual knowledge or that contextual factor may not be relevant um, for the prevention strategy that you're working on. And so therefore, it wouldn't rise to the level of contextual evidence. There are a number of different ways that you can measure contextual evidence. The first is through existing sources of data, which is great. It's a, a low cost, low resource way of gathering information. So sources like the census data um, or local administrative data from hospitals, schools, law enforcement agencies can really provide a wealth of information about the context in a local setting or community that can really help you understand the context. Um, if there are gaps in that information, aspects of the context that you'd really like to learn more about or you think will be really important in terms of implementation of a prevention strategy, you could also gather new data. Um, and there are ways that you can do this at a relatively low cost. Sometimes you can tack on to existing community assessments that are maybe going out um, as part of um, you know, community funding efforts, um, school-based data collections. You can sometimes add a question or two on there to learn more um, about the context of a local community. Um, focus groups and interviews are another great way of being able to gather some quick information from some key informants and folks that are familiar with the setting. So these are all ways that we can really make um, contextual factors and, and aspects of the community measurable and understand more so that we can um, influence our decision making and inform our decision making. Okay, now we've got our last polling question. All right, folks, the last question just came out for folks. This one's a little bit different in that we're gonna ask you to go ahead and enter in your responses into the ask a question box. So the question asks, how do you incorporate the experiences of affected individuals or those with practical experiences into decision-making? Since this is a free, a free text, we're gonna give you all just a few moments to go ahead and start generating some of those responses and entering them into the ask a question box. Natalie, how do you feel about taking the question while they complete that poll? We've got Absolutely. One that, okay. We've got one that just came in talking about the contextual variables that you were just referencing and ways of measuring those. He says those contextual variables are rarely collected on a regular basis at small enough, in small enough geographic areas. BRFSS, the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, is not often enough and the county level is too broad. So it's not collected often enough through that and the county level is too broad. Can you speak to that at all? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, secondary data or administrative data um, at, at small enough local enough levels is, is a sort of perennial issue, right? For, for folks um, working in the field of, of prevention. There are certain census data variables that are available at the census tract level, um, and that can oftentimes be helpful, especially for the more basic sort of demographics information, um, information on median household income, um, trying to think of some of the other ones, even information like alcohol outlet density. Sometimes that can be helpful to know about um, in terms of potential, especially for substance use prevention um, initiatives. I think um, in a lot of cases, especially if folks are working with schools, schools do have a wealth of data, um, oftentimes through their administrative systems, through um, some of their, um, we have a number of schools that participate in the youth um, behavioral risk factor um, surveillance system, YRBSS. Um, and so oftentimes it may require a data use agreement. It may require some sort of an official MOU um, but building strong partnerships with schools and school administrators, if that's the setting that you're working in, oftentimes you can get data for that local setting um, through those, those partnership efforts and through um, you know, official data use agreements. But it is, it is a challenge. It really is a challenge. And so sometimes focus groups, key informant interviews, they can be really helpful as well um, when trying to fill those gaps and learn about the context.
if those secondary data sources are really lacking and not, not giving you the information that you need. Okay, I'm so excited to see all these answers coming in for our last question here. So focus groups is a way that folks um, gather information and learn um, from the folks that they're serving in communities. Advisory boards, technical support through providing technical support, considering their feelings when making decisions um, and not sharing experiences without permission. Um, Oh, okay, someone is asking if we can rephrase, not sure what we mean, what we mean. Patty, is there a way, could you, um, I'm not seeing the question show up on my screen. Would there be a way to, to type it into the chat? Yes, I will do that now. Okay, great. I just wanna make sure I'm rephrasing it in a different way, not the original way. <laughs> So that was just submitted and Natalie, if you scroll down to the bottom of the response options, you'll see it. Great. Mm -hmm. Okay, how do you incorporate the experiences of affected individuals of those with practical experience or those with practical experience into decision-making? So when making decisions about which prevention strategies um, to support um, in local communities, in the communities that you're serving, how do you incorporate the perspectives, the preferences, the experience of folks that you'll be serving? Um, so that could be if you're working on youth substance use prevention, um, parents, youth, school administrators, um, how are those perspectives incorporated into your decision-making processes and, and how do you gather that information? Does that help? Someone said they would have representation on the drug-free coalitions, which would help decide what community activities to explore. That's great. So there's already structures in place um, for making sure that those, those key folks who are being served by the programs are, are integrated into the decision-making process. More, more votes for focus areas, collective testimonies, and practical lessons learned. Great. And then community surveys to gather information on needs and perceptions. This is great. Talk to audiences and groups, conversations with the community, making sure they're involved in the decision-making. This is wonderful. I, I hope that, um, that the chat is available or these answers are available to download after because I'd love to, to keep these because these are all such great, um, great ways that folks are integrating the experience of those that they're serving into, into the work that you all are doing. That's great. So really, um, the examples that you all have provided here really are examples of experiential evidence, which is the last form of evidence in our um, framework for thinking about evidence. So again, when we were working with our partners to develop this framework, it was clear that best available research evidence was an important part of this decision-making process, that gathering information um, on the context, right? So demographics, things like that, aspects of the context was important, but there was still a piece that was missing. There was still this piece of, yeah, but we just know it's not gonna work here, right? That we kept hearing from folks. Um, and really what that was about is it was the lived experience of folks who have lived, and work in a community that, that is um, being served by the prevention strategy. It's also the experience of folks who have maybe implemented this strategy across multiple different contexts and have some lessons learned about what pieces or aspects of the strategy can be adapted, um, what kinds of things work well when implementing a strategy, what doesn't work so well, what kind of landed flat when implementing a strategy. And so um, we really, through those conversations and through through sort of um, uh, understanding more about this this missing piece, developed this concept of experiential evidence as the final piece of our evidence based decision making framework. So, experiential evidence is the collective experience and expertise of those who have practiced or lived in a particular setting, and it could also be the knowledge again of subject matter experts, um, more specifically those folks who have implemented these strategies across different contexts and with different populations and have experience in the things that work well and don't work so well in the real world related to that strategy. The questions that experiential evidence can help us answer are what has previously worked or not worked in the community? Would this program appeal to stakeholders and participants? So for example, you could have the most evidence-based program in the world, but if a pro that same program or a program similar to it 
was implemented really poorly in the past if community members were felt disrespected, um, if there were negative experiences associated with that program in the past, you're very unlikely to be able to overcome that. Um, and so that community history, the history of implementation, um, the kinds of strategies that have worked and not worked so well in the past is really critical and important information to know as you're making decisions about, about what kinds of strategies to implement. What are the common goals among stakeholders related to the issue that you're looking to address? And then how well matched are those goals to the programs based on the best available research evidence that are being considered? So experiential evidence can be measured and gathered in a number of different ways. Actually, folks put in the chat box lots of the different ways um, that, that we learned and heard from, from our partners in the field when we were um, putting this framework together. So reflective questions through focus groups, through interviews um, that really help to gather information from folks, again, with lived experience who are likely to be served or to be implementing or affected by the programs and strategies to get information, get their perspectives, get their experiences. Um, you could also potentially tap into existing communities of practice or um, team decision-making processes or other consensus processes. Oftentimes in schools, there may be peer learning communities um, or other existing communities of practice that you could join and, um, and talk with teachers and school staff um, and other folks to gather their experiences and their, their thoughts around um, different potential um, strategies. And expert panels is another way you could potentially gather this information, particularly around um, gathering information from folks who have implemented these strategies in the past. And again, gathering those lessons learned about what worked well, what didn't work so well. So finally, um, once we have sort of gathered all of these different pieces of evidence, right, from evidence-based um, uh, or the best available research evidence, maybe going to a number of different registries like the Blueprints Registry um, or CASEL has a great registry with social emotional learning programs that really overlap well with substance use prevention. Um, there's also, I think, the Athena Toolkit, the folks at ADAPT shared that with us. Um, those are places where you could really gather that best available research evidence. Um, some of the other ideas that folks put in the chat box, literature reviews, journal articles, going to peers um, who have implemented strategies that are based in evidence or have done their own evaluations on their strategies. There's all great ways to gather that best available research evidence. Contextual evidence, again, through those either um, census data, other existing data sources, or through gathering your own data um, through surveys, focus groups and then experiential evidence with folks who are um, living and working in the communities that you're serving. Gathering all that information together um, and then interpreting, once you have all three of those different sort of pieces of evidence, where are the overlaps? Where are the um, places where there may not be such great fit between that evidence -based, those evidence-based strategies that you're considering and what you know now about the context, about the community history, about the experiences of the folks that you'll be serving? And then once you sort of interpret and integrate those findings together, applying what you've learned, um, you know, coming up with a list of, okay, this is our top strategy based on what we know now about the context, about the experiences of the community, what we know in terms of the evidence-based literature, um, and keeping a, mi a mind towards when you're going through this process of gathering, interpreting, and applying the evidence that you're gathering together, um, it's really helpful to have a defined process um, among the folks that are making these decisions. Skilled leadership and facilitation can be really important. Sometimes folks can really disagree on the interpretation of evidence, um, or they may be really invested in a particular program, especially if there's a program that's already in place and they've put a lot of time and energy towards seeing it, seeing it through. Um, it can be really difficult sometimes to engage in these kinds of conversations and decision-making. So having a skilled leader um, to help facilitate that process can be really helpful. Transparency, you know, being really transparent about the goals of the group. Um, sometimes there just are lines in the sand that you can't um, that you can't get get around. So, for example, I think someone put in the chat that they have a sort of prescribed list of strategies that they need to choose from um, from their state, and so just being transparent about we have to choose from this list of strategies. We can't really go beyond this. These are the constraints of our decision-making process. Inclusiveness and participation. Um, so folks shared a lot of the different ways that they um, engage 
and work with folks that they're serving in their communities in the decision-making process. And then openness and explicitness. So just being really clear about um, what are the uh, the reasons that you're making this this decision about which which prevention strategy to implement, what are the criteria that your group is really using to make that decision and documenting that so that folks can see that um, and you can share that along the way so that the folks that you're serving know how that decision was made. Okay, so that I think wraps it up for um, this background portion of our presentation today, just explaining the, the framework for thinking about evidence. And I'm gonna turn it over now. I think, Laura, were there questions that you wanted to, um, to pose to the group before we move on now to Sally's portion of the presentation where she'll be presenting on the Understanding Evidence website? No questions have come in yet okay. based on, you know, after you have asked all the questions and received the responses, but no new questions have come in. I do wanna just mention very quickly what you have just articulated so beautifully, we will be capturing in well, something we call a pearl. It'll be a 10 to 15 minute summary. Sally and Natalie will be preparing that for us and it will be a summary, especially at that last slide where you're gathering and you're applying and really thinking through the feasibility, the utility, all of the, the contextual and experiential factors. I just wanna to share that with the audience that we'll have a consolidated version of that that they can use moving forward to summarize what they've just experienced from you moving forward. And you're getting a big thank you from the audience coming through. <laughs> oh, thank you all. All right, over to you, Sally. Okay, thanks, Natalie. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Sally Bigpen, and I am a colleague of Natalie's. And Natalie and I are really excited to be here. I'll just reiterate that because it's been a really long time for us since we've been able to talk about this project. And it's kind of, for me anyway, it's it's one of the projects that I I love the most that I've worked on here. So it's really fun to come together and talk about um, this this framework and this tool. Um, so what, what we normally like to do is uh, a little demo to kind of walk you through the, the bells and the whistles that are on this, this web tool, um, but we don't have that capability with the technology today. So I'm just going to walk you through some screenshots just so you can kind of see and get a look and feel for what this tool has to offer. Um, you know, just uh, again, this was built for violence prevention. So the case studies and examples are uh, you know, based in, in violence prevention. Um, but the concepts themselves, the things that Natalie just walked us through are, are universal. Um, they, they, it, it doesn't matter what kind of public health or what issue you're working on, these concepts are, are relevant. So hopefully this, this tool that I walk you through, there'll be bits and pieces of it that you'll find helpful. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of point those out as we go along. Um, but this is the website. Uh, vetoviolence.cdc.gov slash evidence that will take you to this page. This is the landing page. Um, and this will be the first thing you see once you uh, land on there. Some of you might be on there right now walking through it as we walk through it. And that, that's really great. I think that's a good way to go if you all um, want to do that. If you have any questions that come up as you're looking through um, this site, live today right now. I just put it in the Q&A box and we will uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, otherwise, you can, there'll be an email at the end that you can always email me um, and we can find the answer for you if you have questions that we can't answer. So this is your landing page and what you see here are just a lot of, uh, of the bigger pieces of the website. This, this opening video is a one minute video that just kind of walks through in one minute, everything Natalie just said. <laughs> so it's just kind of an overview of what this framework looks like, what these pieces of evidence are um, to just really get you into it. The videos that you'll see on this website are, um, uh, there's four of them and they're kind of, they kind of walk through, I think there might be five. I think they, they um, there might be five of them. There's this one minute one in the beginning. And then there's a section for each of the three uh, types of evidence, so con contextual, experiential, and best available research evidence. They all have their own sort of video training um, that, that have a lot of cool um, features in them, including you know, Q&As, knowledge checks, uh, things like that. 
Um, and then a final video that's just all about bringing it all together and what, what that evidence-based decision-making process um, can look like and can mean. If you look up here in the corner where it says log in, that little yellow button, um, round little button up the top, if you, if you create a, a username and password on this site, a lot of cool things happen um, that, that won't happen for you if you don't have a username and password. Um, and I'll point those out as we go along as well. Um, the next thing that you'll probably see is this pop-up, kind of helps you uh, walk through how to get started, how to create your login, um, things like that. Some people need that, some people don't. Um, you then get to log in once you have your username and password. Um, and after that, you can, um, well, okay, this is, this is one of the things you get if you create a login. Um, so Bob here, he created a login and a password. So when he's going through this, this tool, it kind of collects what Bob's doing as he's walking through the tool. Um, what, what, you know, what his background is, what, um, for, for this tool in, in particular, what, what injury or violence issue Bob focuses on in his work. Um, it'll kind of track which areas his knowledge checks and how that went down when he was going through all of the um, training videos. And it just kind of collects things along the way. So this is one, one of the benefits of the, the creating the login is you get you get your own profile and it actually is based off of what you do in the um, tool itself. So that's a really nice feature. There's also and kind of this you actually might might find helpful. Um, these are one page little kind of kind of what um, you know we, the, the summary that was mentioned earlier that we put together for you. This is this is what this is right here. Um, and there's one for each of the three, um, each of the three areas of the framework. And then there's one that is uh, about resources and kind of where you can find resources that are pertinent to uh, what you have done as you walk through the, um, the tool. So these are there, they're there, they're ready to go. If, if you are interested in something like that, um, you can go to that website and you can print them out. Um, uh, I'll tell you how some folks who've used this um, have shared with us of how they've used these, these features. And I'm gonna share these with you mainly because some of the examples obviously are gonna be violence prevention, but some of these um, kind of concepts are universal. And so when you see these, these one pagers that you can print from the site, um, these little bubbles and quotes are from violence prevention um, practitioners or researchers and folks like that, but everything else is really universal. Um, and so I highly recommend if you go to explore that site that you take a look at these. Some folks who've used this tool have printed these out for their, um, if it's a, like a technical uh, assistance provider, they'll print these out for the folks that they work with so they can kind of have a lead behind. They've printed them out for their uh, advisory boards so that they can all, you know, brush up on what, what these kinds of evidence are, and then uh, work collectively to, to make a, a decision about strategies. So there's lots of ways to use these, these resources. So that's, that's one thing that is there for you if you, if you would like to, to have it. And then we have, okay, again, the video, the training videos themselves, and that's just another, another screenshot of what that looks like. But I think what might be uh, really interesting for you all, um, may or may not, uh, is this interactive continuum of evidence of effectiveness. And, and um, Natalie showed you sort of, a, it's a hard copy version of this, but we actually programmed a continuum of evidence into this website to help folks either determine the level of evidence for a strategy that they may be considering, um, or it, it's, you know, lots of ways, again, the partners have used this tool. Uh, uh, we originally developed this tool with the idea that um, a practitioner or uh, you know uh, an evaluator, a researcher, whoever can go in, click this start assessment button right here. And what happens when you click that start assessment button? 
is a, a series of questions will uh, pop up. And it's, it's programmed on the back end so that depending on how you answer one question, that will determine what your next question is. So it's like choose your own adventure of evidence. Um, and depending on how you answer these questions, uh, what, what will come at the end of that is a, a, a continuum of evidence that has these boxes lit up that shows you based on the answers that you put in, what the evidence for that particular strategy or intervention might look like, where, where the gaps are, where it's strong, where it's not so strong. And I think really what's, what's important here also to think about is if anything, if any of these boxes over here on the far side of this continuum pop up, whether it's unsupported or harmful, those are things you need to think about. Um, harmful, obviously, we don't want to implement any strategies that are harmful. And sometimes uh, answering these assessment questions will show you that there is literature out there, research that shows that this is a harmful strategy. Um, and so that's a really good thing to know. So that's one thing that can be helpful coming out of this. And the other one is, is it unsupported? It has the research been done and it just doesn't show that it's, it, has, it has the impact that it's intended to have. And because we know that any prevention um, strategy that we put into place is going to cost money, we, you know, that's a really good, good, good um, way to understand if it's a good investment of, of resources. If it's unsupported, it might not be the, the strategy for you. So those are a couple of things just to understand about this continuum is that those two columns are there for a reason and can tell you things that are really important to know before you select a strategy. Um, so this is a really cool thing that the continuum of evidence of effectiveness can do in the web tool itself. It can really kind of give you that eyeball, that bird's eye view of, of the strategy and what the evidence is thus far. These questions, I'm going to go, go back. Um, these questions are a little bit challenging. I, I find them challenging. I'm not a trained uh, scientist. I, I'm, I got my training on my feet as I went. So for me, these are easier for me now, but 10 years ago when we were developing this tool, um, I really had to ask Natalie a lot of questions because I, I wasn't yet well-versed in some of these very scientific concepts. Um, and we've heard from our end users the same, that this is a, this is a really, you know, very challenging thing for folks who aren't researchers to answer these questions. So what we've heard from our partners about this is it's really helped, the, uh, helped some of our, our partners who've used this tool build their relationships with academic um, partners. Because, you know, as you know, you all work in partnerships all day long, and you know that if, if you don't have something to engage your partners, some, something concrete for them, they, off, they often disengage and you kind of lose them for a little while. This is a very concrete task. If you have an academic partner or you have an academic institution that you've been trying to partner with and you haven't really found a place for them yet in your work, there, here's their place right here. You can reach out and ask them to help you go through this assessment. Um, and our, our partners, our practitioners said that this was a really helpful way for them to find, sorry if you hear my dog coughing, it sounds gross. Um, it's a really, okay, thank you. It's a really um, helpful way for them to engage in their academic partners and be able to kind of get through this assessment to get what they need out of it, which is, which is the best strategy for us. How can we answer these questions so that when we, when we get this print, this um, printout with this, this sort of output of that assessment, it's A, we know it's, it's, right that we answered the questions and got the right kind of output and it can really tell us where those gaps are and for some folks they really need the the implementation uh, tools so this will tell them if it's really strong with the implementation and if it's you know in here in the middle range for other things as long as you have that implementation toolkit it's it's good enough it's it's what you need because you don't have the capacity or the resources to build your own tools so those are kind of things to consider there. I'm going to pause, Natalie, to see if there's anything you want to add to that uh, continuum piece. No, that's fantastic, Sally. And I love the way you describe this as a build your own adventure, because it, that really is how the questions sort of walk, walk folks through the process. And I also just really love the... Um, 
the lesson learned from applying this with folks in the field or on how this can be a really helpful partnership tool with, with academic partners. Yeah, thanks, Natalie. I, I love that too. We, we got some great feedback. Natalie and I and another colleague of ours spent six months disseminating this. So we heard from a lot of people and, and that was great. I hope we hear from some of you if you decide to, to tap, tap into this. Um, so the next thing you'll see, you have this continuum, you have this really great kind of, you know, light up box uh, to kind of show you the gaps. And then for concepts that you may not be as familiar with, if you click on one of these boxes, you'll get a pop-up that's uh, expert in whatever that area, this is for internal validity. Um, and this is Dan Whitaker, who used to work here. Um, and he is a researcher who has a really great way of talking through internal validity. So each of these boxes here, if you click on them individually, will pull up an uh, uh, expert in that area. And we have both research SMEs, we have um, pr practice SMEs. So you get a little bit of both. So some of that implementation stuff, they'll, there are practitioners who, who have videos here to talk through that too. So it's a pretty broad um, collection of experts that you can click on with these boxes. And again, our partners have told us that they've, they've pulled this up in an in a advisory board meeting and clicked around these sites to these different boxes so that their advisory groups understood the concepts as, as they help make decisions. So lots of ways, again, to, to use this tool other than what it was designed for. Um, and this is just another example of, uh, this is the last video, which is, um, oh no, this is the first video, part one. So this is just talking about how the three bubbles work together in the Venn diagram. Um, so this is just another example of the video training that's available. More of our SMEs, we don't have to spend a lot of time on this. Um, and then what else do we wanna look at? Let's look at this, what's going on here? There we go. Okay, so another benefit of um, the user name and password is that you get this what's next document. And this is a collection of everything that you've done um, and, and your user experience. So all of your, um, what's, you know, you have learning, um, learning checks in the training videos, you have the continuum. Um, there are different things throughout your experience as you walk through these different uh, tools that actually end up in this document. And this will, depending on what you, you know, what kinds of things you looked at, um, how your knowledge checks were, what you're most interested in, it will give you this printout that has the three um, the three types of evidence, uh, what what they mean for you, and your, if this won't be as tailored for you if you use this because this is about violence and injury prevention, and, and you know that's not your area. But it, again, some of these are universal and crossover. It will also print out resources for um, ways to collect and interpret contextual evidence, ways to collect and interpret experiential evidence, and ways to collect and interpret uh, best available research evidence. And so all of that will be in this, this handy little takeaway um, that has the links and, you know, places to go. And it's just a really nice uh, tool, a little takeaway um, after you're done. Um, this is just how we built out, just examples of how we built out the tool and a child maltreatment is just one of the different vignettes that come up. We have youth violence. Um, we have sexual and domestic violence. I think that's all we have in there right now. I might be wrong. Um, and so a few more things to be thinking about. There's a glossary for any terms that might be confusing. And again, I really highly suggest that you click around in the continuum of evidence and, and hear from actual people who, who know how to talk about this, this kind of stuff. Um, we have some frequently asked questions. All of those can be found again in the resource center, which you can get to this resource center from the homepage. There's a big button of three on the homepage and one of them says resource center. And if you come here, you can look at the videos in isolation without having to go through the whole, um, the whole 
site. Um, you'll have some case studies if you're interested. Again, these are built around um, violence prevention. We have module summaries. We have a lot of resources, the glossary and some bonus materials here um, to explore. And that's about it. I think we've done our walkthrough here. This is the last page. It's like really happy that you've congratulating you that you've gotten through it all. And then uh, these are ways to access those, those supplemental pieces that you can print out and take, take away with you or share with others. And that's the walkthrough um, is, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm just going to stop, see if there's any questions, stop for Natalie to interject. I might've missed a thing or two. Um, this is the first time in a few years that we've been able to do this. So, and it's, uh, it's been fun, huh, Natalie? It's been really fun. Sorry. I keep having a, a delay as I try to get off of pause. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I echo what Sally said. This is one of the funnest projects um, that we've worked on at CDC. So excited to be able to share it with all of you and to learn from you. Definitely. Do, does anybody have any, um, any questions or concerns, any emotional outbursts? We'll take those too. Um, any, just anything. I, I don't, I, I would love to hear from anybody who's willing to share, um, if you know we've spent some time talking to you and, and is this helpful do you think this could be helpful in the work that you're doing or is this too tailored to an area that you don't work in what do, what do you all think of this sally while we wait for more responses to come in we have someone mentioning that when they clicked on the link the website did open but the evidence page showed page not found Okay, so if you go to the fetal violence without all of the other stuff, just fetalviolence.org, it'll pull up the fetal violence homepage. And if you scroll down, there's a list of different, uh, click on the training tab button, and then you can scroll down that training list. There's a ton of stuff in there. And, and I think the second one from the bottom is understanding F. If you click on that, it will definitely take you. So I'm, I'm looking at it right now, and that's how I got in. I wish we could do it live so I could show you how that works, but um, you just go in through veto violence instead of the direct link, and you'll get there. So that's that makes wonderful. sense? Thank you, Sally. Um, and we did correct the address to access it in your Q&A responses, so you all should have the correct link to that. The correct link is also in your resource supplement under your event resources tab. You're receiving a lot of thank yous as well. And I'm wondering, as we wait on more questions, Sally and Natalie, if you can speak to, you've done this for a while, and I know you said you're just getting back into it again. It's fun to kind of revisit it. But in your experience, can you list or describe any examples of ways that people have really brought this to life in a particular project or in maybe they're in beginning stages of thinking through developing a program? But do you have any on the ready examples of ways people have specifically used this, concrete examples of that? Well, I have one that we're actually working on right now in uh, Georgia. We have a, the, the program that I work with right now is the um, core state injury and violence prevention program. Um, and through that, we're working with one of our recipients in Georgia to, who, who wanted to figure out a way to do a statewide assessment of what their locals are implementing for uh, home visitation. And there's a lot of different, you know, home visitation strategies out there. Some of them have great evidence. Some of them have no evidence. And Georgia, the Georgia Public Department of Public Health really wanted to take a look across the state, have some way to categorize the home visitation efforts going on in their locals. Um, and so we're working with them to um, adapt a little bit the continuum so that it's more relevant. And then they're using that as a way to ask questions of their locals to kind of figure out the strength of evidence for home visitation across the state. And, you know, they've created a map to kind of show them where there's strong evidence and where there's 
not so strong evidence. And the next phase of that project for them is to be able to know where they need to go in and do more intensive technical support to get folks, you know, implementing home visitation that actually has, you know, some evidence. And the thing I like to say about evidence is, you know, we try to use the term best available evidence or evidence informed um, because evidence based is a, you know, means a lot of things to a lot of people. And some areas of our work in public health are still early in the early stages of building the evidence. And so this is an, another way to kind of plug into what the, what is the state of the evidence for whatever the uh, work is that you're doing and how can you strengthen that evidence? Because a lot of that building of evidence doesn't happen here at CDC. It happens out there with you all. Um, so, you know, just understanding how to do that um, and then how to report that out so that you're contributing to the evidence base. You're, the work you're doing is actually informing the evidence base for the particular issues that you're working on. Um, and, and that's another, I think, value of the, of the tool. That's one thing that George is doing. Natalie, I don't, have you ever used it? In, I, I don't know what you've done with this. Yeah, you know, I think um, one of one of the sort of broader examples that, that that comes to mind is just around the concept of contextual and experiential evidence. We've definitely heard from our partners in the field that you know, in doing good practice, right, in being good stewards, um, both of the the needs of the community um, and of you know funding and resources, folks have been engaging. Um, their their community members, the folks that they serve in their work for a really long time, just knowing that that's important and critical, not just for um, respect and, um, you know, shared power and ownership with the communities that they're serving, but also for the effectiveness of the strategy, right, to, to be able to get to the outcomes that, that everyone's hoping for. Um, but oftentimes the way that evidence has been talked about, it's only been talked about as best available research evidence, right? And and what our hope was with this framework is to show that it's not an either or. It's not, you know, the field versus the researchers or, you know, the, the research based evidence versus um, practitioner knowledge and, and experience and community knowledge, experience and expertise. It's an all of the above, right? All of these pieces of information and evidence are critical for making the best decision possible, the decision that's likely to result in the intended effects that everybody is hoping for. Um, and so that's one of the things that we have heard sort of more broadly from folks who have taken this framework and used it in their own work, is that by elevating contextual and experiential knowledge information to the level of evidence has been really critical in the work that they're doing and in sort of validating and justifying how important it is for those pieces to be a critical part of, of their process. Natalie and Sally, thank you for that. One thing that has come up within the Washington Baltimore Haida region recently is we've conducted a few focus groups across our region for to be exact, and we've heard from the communities that there's an ever-changing landscape of substance use, as we all know. You know, what you're seeing in one region doesn't necessarily reflect what you're seeing in another. Culture is different among communities, states, populations, right? And one thing that really struck me in a couple of our focus groups is this idea that there are evidence based programming, there is evidence-based programming available, or there could be best available evidence for a particular substance they might be struggling with or poly substance use. However, when they think about implementing that, considering their contextual and experiential factors, it just doesn't seem like a good fit, to use your words, Natalie. And so, one idea that's been generated that's not novel it's you know it's not new but it is it's it's coming up again is this idea they mentioned that you know if we really want to find a solution we're going to go to the parents and we're going to ask the parents what they think about for their kids or their adolescents what might work and so it's this community uh, driven activity or program or strategy, right, that starts to emerge and surface. And when coupled with 
what you're suggesting, academic partners or experts in evaluation, experts in implementation, that they could, they could synergize these efforts and they could really develop something meaningful and effective in that community. But could you talk through how you might think about that in the context of this understanding evidence idea and this framework, I, I really appreciate how you guys describe it as a framework for thinking about evidence and really applying it um, on that community level though with homegrown ideas within that community. How, what's a good starting point for them? That's a great question, Sally. Do you want me to, to go first or did you have thoughts? No, you go ahead. So, you know, this, this is one of the things um, that, that we've done some thinking around, right? So one of the limitations of the framework for thinking about evidence is it is primarily focused on existing evidence, right? And how to use and um, gather and interpret existing evidence. But like you were mentioning, Laura, oftentimes there aren't any evidence-based strategies that really fit with the local context or fit fit well enough. Um, so, you know, there, there may be a number of different approaches that folks could take in that, in that instance. So one would be maybe to take an evidence-based strategy, but adapt it, you know, heavily adapt it for the local setting with input um, and, uh, you know, working collaboratively with folks in the local community to adapt it in a way that it's really feasible, acceptable, um, and likely to be effective. Um, that could be a heavy lift though, right? So if, if there really don't even seem like there are any evidence-based strategies out there that are even getting close to being a good fit for that community, um, especially if a community already has a homegrown program or strategy that they've started, um, then another option would be to, you know, as Sally was talking about, potentially partner with an academic institution, um, most of the time, universities, colleges have graduate students, undergraduate students, folks who are looking to get some on the ground experience with evaluation and research um, and, you know, are a fairly resource low <laughs> option, you know, oftentimes will work for free, um, you know, because it's part of their training and their learning experience. So partnering with universities, partnering with students um, to evaluate the effectiveness of the that homegrown strategy, right? That strategy that's being developed from the ground up. Um, you know, as Sally mentioned before, the evidence that are that currently exists, right? Those evidence-based programs that currently sit on those registries, most of those were homegrown strategies that were evaluated um, and then became evidence-based, right? When they when they found um, that they had effects in the intended intended areas that they were hoping to. So, really, I mean, I think that's. Another option is if you're really not finding a strategy that looks like it'll fit well, um, can you instead maybe turn towards developing those partnerships um, and evaluating um, your own homegrown strategy? Because at the end of the day, um, it's really important that a strategy be accepted um, and feasible and useful for the community that it's serving. And you really don't wanna get into a situation where you're causing harm with the work that you're doing. So if they're really, you don't want to force the fit. If there's something that really is not going to fit the bill, is not going to be successful or, or accepted in a community, then there, those other options may be a better way to go. Yeah, Natalie, I love that. And just to add a little bit to what you, you've already said, I, I, you know, I think that it's another potential way to use the interactive continuum um, is, is to kind of see where your homegrown uh, intervention kind of stands at the moment. Have you done some basic evaluation on on your strategy? Have, have you, you know, you obviously, if it's something that you're, you keep doing, you've probably done some sort of evaluation. You know that there's something you're getting out of it um, or else you wouldn't keep doing it. Um, and so that continuum might help you understand how to package that information so that you, it, you know, if, you know, kind of the language to put around the findings of your evaluation, that can help you in writing for for funding um, from funders if they know that you're you know you're interested in, in, in making sure that what you're implementing is going to have an impact um, and and so have, having the language to wrap around the work that you're doing in that area is really great for for funding applications quite honestly if I can be brutally honest um, so you know those are kind of ways to use the tool to your benefit and 
I, you know, I, I am a big believer in practice-based evidence. I think that there's so many good things happening out there um, that is really helping people in these different areas of, of keeping keeping folks healthy and happy. And we, we, we don't know about them yet because they haven't been um, put in the right context, let's just say. And I think that this is a way to do that. You know, go through, learn the language, uh, take, you know, do, do a little bit of an assessment to see what you already have in place. Just because it hasn't been published yet doesn't mean you haven't done it uh, or a little bit of it. So I, I think that that's another way to kind of use it if you're in, a, in the early stages of implementing something that's, you know, pieces and parts of other things that you've put together or something that's completely homegrown. Um, yeah, I, I'm rambling now. Sorry, Natalie. <laughs> Thank you both for your responses. I think they're on point and really something the audience can use to carry that forward. I wanted to offer, ADAPT does assist a lot of HIDA communities in simply just getting connected with experts and academic partners. And so we are available. Our email contact information is in the resource supplement, but please reach out to us. We, If you don't know of evaluators or maybe academic departments that might be a good fit for something that you're trying to do, we're happy to help you get connected and reach out and just explore what some of the possibilities are in your area for those evaluation and even implementation resources. But again, the goal is to just help advance your way of thinking through it. And then once you are on that journey, right, being able to support you with reinforcements in your local area to, to assist in that process. We have not had any additional questions come in. I'm wondering, Sally and Natalie, if you have um, any additional thoughts. We do have a YouTube channel that, I just wanna alert the audience to this, ADAPT's YouTube channel has fundamental concepts like program planning, like evaluation, if you do have, I love how we're running with this homegrown <laughs> phrase, if you do have homegrown um, interventions or, or strategies that you are trying out or maybe have been operating for years um, and you just want to learn more about how to think through formalizing an infrastructure for getting it to the point where you can, then go to the thinking about evidence framework and land somewhere and start to move yourself along that continuum. The program planning, the evaluation, technical webinars are excellent starting points, guys. And another place I might refer you to is the Strategic Prevention Framework out of SAMHSA. It's another excellent resource that you can rely on to help you think through assessment and capacity building, things of that nature. Sally or Natalie, any final comments? Well, this is this is Sally. I I just want to thank you for inviting us to to come today and and talk about this. It's been really really fun for for us to brush it off and talk about all this nerdy stuff with you all. I hope it was helpful. Um, but I really I really enjoyed spending some time with you today. So thank you for for inviting and inviting us. <laughs> Yes, thank you. I echo echo Sally's sentiments. It was wonderful getting to spend some time with you all um, and, and to learn about the work that you all are doing. And if you have any questions or thoughts or, as Sally mentioned before, stories of, of if and how you use this in your work, we'd love to hear that. Thank you. Patty, I'm going to hand it back to you to talk about any upcoming webinars we have. I know we've got one on the docket and to share with the audience the evaluation summary. That is correct. So thank you again to Natalie and Sally for your excellent presentation today. Um, one of the things that we do have coming up, our next webinar is going to be on Tuesday, July 14th at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time. This is going to be focused on what works and doesn't in drug prevention with an emphasis on effective and less effective uh, drug prevention strategies. So we're very excited to be offering that. That will be offered by Dr. Robert Lachos, who is coming back to the series. Um, he previously presented on our program planning and program evaluation webinars.
the announcement for that, the formal announcement should be coming out within the next few business days. So keep your eye out, eye out for that. If you are not already on our um, email distribution in the resource supplement, you will find a link for how you can go ahead and get subscribed to that distribution list. And finally, once the webinar ends today, um, what you will notice is a post-presentation evaluation will just automatically appear on your screen. That is required for your certificate of completion and continuing education credits. But even if you don't need that certificate, we encourage everybody to take a moment to provide their input. We really do use that information in order to help sort of frame and, and think through our upcoming uh, presentations and ongoing training needs around this topic and other topics as well. So thank you all. We wish you a wonderful rest of your day. Take care.